Hello and welcome. I'm Father Mike Tuath. Lutheran pastor Richard Warmbrand, in his book, In God's Underground, tells the story of his experiences while imprisoned in Romania for his religious views. In one scene, he describes the arrival of a new prisoner named Avram. He had been badly injured and was in an upper body cast. The guards put him in the cell with Wormbrand and some others, slammed the cell door and departed. Avram lay in silence for a while. Then his hand slowly, deliberately disappeared beneath the cast and it emerged with a small, tattered book. Wormbrun writes, none of us had seen a book of any kind for years. Avram lay there quietly, turning the pages, until he became conscious of the eager eyes fixed on him. Your book, Wormbrun said, what is it? Where did you get it? Avram closed the book. It's the gospel according to John, he said. He had managed to conceal it under his cast at the time of his arrest. Avram held out the book. Wervram says, I took the little book in my hands as if it were a live bird. No life-saving drug could have been more precious to me. Indeed, the Bible is precious to us. It is our story as God's people, and we need to ask the same questions Wormbrand asked, as if we too were holding this precious gift in our hands for the first time. What is it? Where did it come from? Join us now as we explore what Catholics believe about the Bible. One preacher often tells his congregation that the word Bible is an acronym for basic information before leaving earth. Actually, the word Bible comes from a Greek word that means books. What do you think? Which of the following statements best describes what we as Catholics believe about the Bible? A history book which describes important religious events? A collection of many books written at different times under God's inspiration? A book written by the early church about God's plan for mankind? or a collection of books about the life of the prophets, Jesus, and his apostles. What do you think? Well, here's what some other Catholics believe. To me, it's God speaking to us. It's our opportunity to listen to God speak to us. The Bible, I would describe it as rules for living, a way of life. A collection of books about Jesus and his apostles. It's a, it's a love letter from God. Well, I think it's a consolidation of really all four. It is a history of the church, and it was, it was written by different people at different times. Well, the correct answer is a collection of many books written at different times under God's inspiration. And here's why. The Bible is a collection of writings about God, God's relationship with humankind, about our relationship with God as people and as individuals, and about how God wants people to relate to one another. Many different people under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit wrote the books of the Bible. Thus, the Bible comes from the believing community, the church, as a testimony of what our Jewish faith ancestors believed about their relationship with God and what we Christians believe about our relationship with God. Okay, our next question. As you probably know, there are two main divisions of the Bible recognized by Catholics, the Old and the New Testament. What does the word testament mean? Testimony, covenant, or inheritance? Uh, covenant, I think, isn't it? Inheritance. Somebody's um, declaration of something that's very important to them. It is testimony of, of God's word. Actually, the answer is covenant. It's our promise from God to his people. The word testament in the Bible means an agreement or covenant. The Old Testament, for the most part, is a collection of books about the agreement or covenant between God and our Jewish ancestors in the faith. The books of the New Testament are about the agreement or covenant between God through Jesus and his people. 
the covenant conferred a special sanctity. Yahweh promised to be our God and to deliver us from harm if we would be his people. This covenant was expressed in different ways and in different dimensions throughout the Old Testament. The New Testament is a continuation, not an annulment of the covenant between God and his people. In fact, Catholics believe it is fulfilled and continued to perfection, as Paul states in his letter to the Galatians. Let's take a look at some historical elements of the Bible. Most of the books of the Bible had been written by about the end of the first century, second century, fourth century, or 16th century. By the end of the first century. I would say probably the fourth. End of the first century. I think it's at the end of the fourth century. That sounds like a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> the correct answer is the end of the first century. For 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, missionaries spread the good news of Jesus by preaching. Eventually, Christians began to feel a need to preserve their heritage in writing. Collections of the sayings of Jesus, liturgical prayers, and professions of faith began to appear. By the end of the first century, most of the books of the Bible had been written. And by the end of the second century, most Christians accepted the 46 books of the Old Testament and the 27 books of the New Testament. And by the end of the 4th century, official lists of these 73 books were approved by church councils. True or false? The books of the Bible are organized according to chronology or subject matter and are accurate in their historical and scientific facts. Let's hear what some people had to say. No. False. I really don't know. Yes, true. Actually, the answer is false. The Bible is not inerrant when it speaks of certain specific happenings in the world, such as history, or how this universe was formed and how it functions, such as science. Biblical truthfulness does not stand or fall on whether the Medes ruled Babylonia when Cyrus the Persian conquered it. The author of the book of Daniel, for instance, apparently thought so. But the evidence is this is not historically correct. Take the book of Genesis, for example. In using the six-day chronology of creation, the author was concerned, among other things, with the Jewish work week that ended with Sabbath rest. The author's point was that even God observed the Sabbath at creation. The religious truths talked in the opening chapters of Genesis are so profound and so important that even scientific and historical details pale in comparison. Catholics are fortunate to have this authoritative interpretation of biblical inerrancy. It makes it possible to accept scientific theories and conclusions of history and historical research without fear of contradicting God's word. Let's move on to a question which has to do with inspiration. We Catholics recognize 46 books of the Old Testament and 27 books of the New Testament as inspired by God. Now, pay close attention. Inspired means all of the following except revelation from God, God's own word, dictated by God, or written by people who were guided by God to teach religious truth. If you said inspired does not mean dictated by God, you're right. Inspired does not mean that God actually sat down and dictated the Bible word for word to its writers. Divine inspiration means that God is the author of the Bible. He chose certain people who made use of their powers and abilities so that with the Holy Spirit acting in them and through them, they as true authors wrote everything and only those things God wanted. The Bible therefore teaches firmly and faithfully and without error the truth that God wanted to put into the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. In the preceding question, we noted that there are 46 books in the Catholic Old Testament. But as you may know, the Protestant Bible differs somewhat. So here's a numbers question for you. How many books are there in the Protestant version of the Old Testament? 23, 39, or 42? 
39. Uh, 70... Uh, oh, in the Old Testament, 41, I think. 39! <laughs> That's it, it's 39. 39. The correct answer is 39. The reason for this difference is that in the early days of the church, there were two versions of the Old Testament that were used by Jewish people. An Old Testament in Hebrew used in Palestine did not contain the seven books of Tobit, Judith, Wisdom, Sirach, Baruch, and First and Second Maccabees. And there was also an Old Testament in Greek used by Greek-speaking Jews outside of Palestine. And this version did contain the seven books. Now, the second version of the Old Testament, which had been translated into the Greek about 150 years before the time of Jesus, was called the Septuagint. Then, in the 16th century, the Protestant reformers made their own translation of the Bible into German. Their translation of the Old Testament was from the Hebrew and not the Greek version. So the Protestant Old Testament, like the Hebrew version, lacks the seven books contained in the Greek and Catholic Old Testament. In recent times, however, new translations of the Bible have been the result of a growing cooperation between Protestants and Catholics. The Old Testament books can also be grouped into segments that help us better understand the journey of God's people. Our next question is a simple yes or no, or maybe not so simple. All of the following segments are part of the Old Testament. Pentateuch, the historical books, wisdom books, epistles, and prophets. What do you think? Here's what some other Catholics had to say. <laughs> yes. No. Oh, no. Yes. Okay, yes. I've never heard of the historical books before. <laughs> the answer is no. Epistles, or letters, are actually a part of the New Testament, and most of us are familiar with them from our liturgy. But what about those other sections? The Pentateuch is the collection of the first five books of the Bible. The historical books cover the period from the entry of the Israelites into the Promised Land in about 1225 to the end of the Maccabean Wars in about 135. The wisdom books are an inspired search into the meaning of life. And the author uses poetry and proverbs, sayings and songs. And they face the problems of our origin and destiny, of human suffering, of good and evil, of right and wrong. The prophets are a collection of writings that don't necessarily foretell the future, but they are the words of those who speak for God about situations that were very contemporary to them. Central to the prophets were themes of repentance and the expectation of the Messiah. The word Pentateuch comes from two Greek words, meaning five and books. It is the collection of the first five books of the Bible, which traces the early salvation history of Israel. Which of the following is not part of the Pentateuch? Genesis, Exodus, Psalms, Numbers, Leviticus, or Deuteronomy? Psalms. Psalms is not part of the first five books. I don't know. Leviticus. Psalms. Well, what's your answer? If you said Psalms, then obviously you're someone who knows your Pentateuch. The first five books of the Bible in order are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Psalms are part of the Old Testament and are songs of praise, religious poetry, if you will, and occur much later in the Old Testament. The Psalms are a collection of 150 prayers in the form of Hebrew poetry. Most were written in the years between King David and the Restoration after the Babylonian exile. They address every human emotion and situation, and vary greatly in style, length, and approach. As Hebrew poetry, they depend on the balance of thoughts rather than on rhyme. A good way to use the Psalms is to read through them once, keeping a list of those you find meaningful for private prayer and reflection. Here's another Old Testament question for you. As recorded in the Old Testament, the Decalogue was an important moment for the chosen people. The Decalogue is a name for the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, 
The Code of Hammurabi, or Pharaoh's Ten Curses. Ten Commandments. Decalogue. I think it's the first ten books of the Bible, isn't it? The Ten Commandments, I guess. Code of Hammurabi. Oh. The Golden Rule. If you know your Latin, you know deca means ten. So naturally, the answer is the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are the heart of the Old Testament morality. The Jews accepted them as God's will. They were exposed to Moses on Mount Sinai. They've stood the test of time as standards of morality for countless generations. Why are the commandments so significant? Because they can make us truly free. The Israelites had been slaves in Egypt, and once they escaped from their bondage, God gave them the commandments to safeguard them from falling into a worse slavery, that of sin. People who keep the commandments can enjoy the full range of human freedom without being limited by the restraints imposed by sin. Okay, next question. In addition to the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament, there are two more commandments given by Jesus in the New Testament. Which two of the following four possible answers are they? Love your enemies, love your God, love your neighbor, or love yourself. Here's what some Catholics had to say. Love God and love your neighbor. To love one another and to love God above all things. The answers are love your God and love your neighbor. Good words to live by. Jesus did more than affirm the Ten Commandments. He urged us to strive toward the higher standards. Jesus repudiated narrow, legalistic interpretations of the law. And he taught that the good of humans must come before mere legalism. Laws are necessary and good, but Christ followers must constantly strive to view them according to his mind and his heart. The books of the New Testament can be grouped in the following ways. The four Gospels, Gospel means good news, the Acts of the Apostles, an account of how the early church lived and grew, 13 epistles or letters of Paul or Paul's followers, eight epistles or letters of other apostles, and the book of Revelation. Let's take a closer look at one of the most fascinating yet misunderstood books in the Bible, the book of Revelation. True or false, according to Catholic teaching, the book of Revelation foretells the future. No, I think it's... Doesn't it? It's, it tells the end. True. True. Uh, true. Actually, the answer is false. The book of Revelation, in Catholic thought, is a message of hope for the persecuted Christians of all ages, past, present, and future, promising Christ's ultimate triumph in history. The book of Revelation uses striking symbolism to impart its message. Catholics maintain that these writings are primarily a challenge to communities to continue trusting in God even during times of persecution. The visions of God's eventual conquest described in these works are more a summons to hope than a tract making predictions about the future. It's the genius of the book of Revelation that its dragons, prostitutes, plagues, and other symbols apply to every age. The four Gospels of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are most precious to Christians because they reveal the life and thought of Jesus to us like no other book in the Bible. But why were several Gospels written instead of just one? Gospel writers were not able to agree on details, Writers worked without knowledge of other gospel accounts. Different gospels were written for different communities, or several gospels were needed to ensure accuracy. Why was more than one gospel written? Uh, because of the accounts of the different apostles, um, different communities. That's what it was, it was different communities. Because um, there were different um, groups that were established and each of the writers were coming from their perspective. Well, the church cut out some of them, so they 
Math is Mark, Luther, and John meant more to the peoples they figured than the rest of them. The correct answer on this one is several different Gospels were written for different communities. After the resurrection of Jesus came oral preaching about him. Next, collections of his sayings, miracles, hymns, professions of faith, and then the writing of the Gospels by the evangelists. The Gospels reflect the shared faith of the first Christians in the Lord who is risen and now dwells among us. In many ways, the New Testament can be read as the early history of the church set down in writing. Much of Catholic doctrine can be found in the Bible and can also be expressed through sacred tradition. By sacred tradition, we mean the Bible, decisions of councils, creeds, worship, and or consistent teaching of the church. By the way, what do you think sacred tradition means? Creeds. I have an idea as far as whether or not it's biblical, I think might be a different issue. Um, ecumenical councils. Worship. Actually, I think it's all of those. My friend here answered all of the above. And if you answered the same way, you said a mouthful and you were correct. Here's what we mean by sacred tradition. The importance of church tradition is emphasized by St. Paul in his letter to the Thessalonians. He wrote, So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. The Second Vatican Council document on Revelation said it this way, Sacred tradition is the process which hands on in full purity God's word, which was entrusted to the apostles by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit. The idea of sacred tradition embraces both the handing on process and its products. Examples of basic forms of tradition are the Bible, the handing on of God's word, the Apostles' Creed, and the basic forms of Christian worship. Some products of sacred tradition are ideas reflected in scripture that were later developed. And tradition also included later teachings of the Pope and bishops acting together. As followers of Christ, we seek the truth. In the Bible, Jesus tells us that his church would be guided to all truth by scripture, the Holy Spirit, the Pope, or sacred tradition? I think the Holy Spirit. I guess I was, um, if I have to pick one answer, I would pick sacred tradition, but I also would think it's guided by the Bible, which is linked. By the Bible. The Holy Spirit? I, yeah, I was going to say the Holy Spirit. Oh, so by the Holy Spirit. Maybe a little bit of a trick question based on the previous answer, but the correct answer is actually the Holy Spirit. Scripture records Jesus' as saying in John's Gospel, If you love me and obey the commands I give you, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another paraclete to be with you always. If the Holy Spirit is called another paraclete, then that must mean that Jesus is the first paraclete. Whatever Jesus was for his disciples is what the Holy Spirit will be for the Christian community. What that means is that the Holy Spirit is the personal presence of Jesus in the Christian community while Jesus is with the Father. When Jesus said that this paraclete would be with us always, he meant that the inspired words of the gospel weren't meant only for the end of the first century, but applies to all time. The incredible message the evangelist was trying to convey was that through the work of the Holy Spirit, it is possible for a Christian to know Christ far more fully and adequately now, after the resurrection, than he or she could have known Jesus by seeing him only in the days of his earthly life. As we have seen throughout this program, we can only begin to scratch the surface of understanding the Bible 
How should we approach what would seem to be the insurmountable task of reading the Bible? Should we read from front to back? From back to front? With good sense? Or in a spirit of prayer? All of those, actually, but especially emphasizing the last with prayer involved. In a spirit of prayer, when I pick up the Bible, I will generally go to pieces that I like. I'll go through, mostly John, I love John, but I go through others. I like to read St. Paul. Those are the two pieces I read more than any place else. Read in the spirit of prayer. <laughs> Even though it might be tempting to answer front to back, the correct answers are actually with good sense and in a spirit of prayer. Books are written about how to read and interpret and understand the various writings of the Bible. For the most brilliant or for the most simple, the advice would be the same. Read with good sense and with a sense of prayer. The need for prayer is obvious. We must read the Bible with good sense because biblical writers wrote to the people of their own time and culture. The writer and the reader shared the same mental picture, a picture that may be quite different to us. Perhaps a good way to understand would be to imagine people in the 23rd century finding one of our current newspapers. In it, they would find, among other things, news stories, doctor's columns, crossword puzzles, and advertisements. We would hope our 23rd century reader would know enough not to read the entire paper as though every article was the same in style, purpose, and content. That's the way it is with us when we're reading the Bible. We have to remember that the various books were written at different times in history, by different people, and for different reasons. We need to work with diligence to learn the meaning of each particular book and the meaning or intent of its author. We must know when, where, why, and by whom a given passage was written in order to understand it. Well, that's it for this edition of What Catholics Believe. Let's not forget Richard Warmbrand's sense of reverence and joy at holding God's precious word in his cradling hands. It is indeed our story as people of God. <laughs>